Good evening, everyone. We'll start in a couple of minutes here. I'm just going to let people trickle in for the next two or three minutes. Matt, you're muted. Thank you for that, Raylene. Sorry about that, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, this is the second open house meeting for the new Gray Highland Zoning Bylaw, the draft zoning bylaw. Uh, this is the same content tonight that was presented back in July at the in-person meeting at the Kimplex in Flesherton. Um, the presentation tonight, well, tonight's meeting will have a presentation from myself. I'm, I'm Matt Rapke, I'm the manager of planning. And then after the presentation, uh, we'll have a, a question and answer period. So kind of what we're going to go through tonight is communications for the project, uh, how you can reach out to us and get answers. A little bit on private property rights and planning act, why we plan what is a zoning bylaw, the significance of updating any zoning bylaw, the project itself called Zone Gray Highlands, the new zoning bylaw, going over what kind of the objectives were with this initial draft, the process for council and public review and involvement, and a review of the proposed significant changes in this draft versus what's currently in place, and then we'll have the, that question and answer period. So to start, we have a dedicated email address for inquiries for the new zoning bylaw, which is zonegh at grayhighlands.ca. That's the preferred means of contact. So if you send your, if you have a question, it's best to send it in writing to that email address. If you have other planning related questions that are not specific to the new zoning bylaw, that is the general Gray Highlands planning uh, uh, email address just for your information. So that's planning at grayhighlands.ca. And then our general inquiry line for the phone is shown there. It's the Gray Highlands phone number, extension 228. Uh, email is the preferred means of contact. You can reach out by phone. I will be the primary contact to respond to most inquiries. Um, I'm not generally available immediately by phone. So if you call in, you can leave a message. I will get back to you. Uh, we can make a meeting and schedule a phone call. Uh, it's easiest if you're able to send an email, you send one because then I can respond to those as I'm available uh, in writing and then you have you have all the answers right there and then we can have it on file too and we can add it to our, our comments uh, summary to council. There's a website for the project, zonegrayhighlands.ca. That's the, the address below that is the proper uh, URL, but if you put in Zone Gray Highlands, it will take you to the web page. That website has the draft of the bylaw. It has some reports that have been done on the topic so far to council. There's a report on eliminating parking minimums. You can subscribe to that web page and it will send push notifications. You can also, when you email us, you can ask to be added. You have your email added to a notification list, and so then we can make sure that 
you were sent an email for subsequent meetings or releases of new drafts or, or materials as we move through the project. So starting with the legislative authority to control land use. So in, in Ontario, everyone kind of knows property owners have rights. You have right to use your land and exclude others from, from using your land. But those rights are bestowed upon you by the government. You only have the right to own land, exclude others from it, and use it because the government, through a set of laws and ultimately enforcement through police, uh, upholds your rights, upholds your property rights. And the government can then restrict those rights in a reasonable manner in order to uphold the public interest. So that's where land use planning controls come in, and they come in through the Planning Act. The Planning Act is a, it's a provincial piece of legislation, and it establishes how municipalities can and must control the use of land in Ontario in order to balance private interests against public interests. This is the general overview of the, the legislative frameworks of the Planning Act. That's a piece of legislation that establishes what all of these things underneath it are. So it gives, uh, you know, it, it provides direction that the provincial, the provincial direction is paramount and that the province will provide its direction on how land should and should not be developed through policy statements. And then any decision made under the Planning Act must comply with that direction from the province. These other documents below it, the county official plan and the local official plan, must then take their direction from the provincial policy statement, which is a policy document separate from the Planning Act that's released by the province with a little bit more specificity on how you're going to do things. Those all have to comply with that document. And then you get down to the zoning bylaw, which has to comply with everything else above it. And we'll get into more detail later on on what exactly the zoning bylaw does, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff above it. So it's not the be all end all of land use planning and land use planning controls. There are these other elements, but the zoning bylaw is, is a very important piece. So why do we plan? Well, it allows us to manage and direct physical change and its effect on the social, economic, built and natural environment. It allows us to control the what, when, where and how of all new land uses to ensure, again, that the public interest is maintained and that desirable community outcomes are achieved. When we think about desirable community outcomes, I like to think about them kind of as attributes. And these are the six kind of broad attributes that I think result in a, in a happy community ultimately and that's a healthy safe productive adaptable and resilient those three are all kind of the same theme inclusive and accessible beautiful and wealthy community and healthy means our citizens our citizens are healthy we have access to health care we're all healthy people or as healthy as we can be we want to maximize the health of our citizens it also means environmental health we don't want to be polluting our, our rivers and clear-cutting all our forests. We like to have healthy places. We want our places to be safe. That means crime, but also just you want your, your kid to be able to walk to school without being run over. So there's an infrastructure element to that that results from how we plan things physically. And we want places to be productive, adaptable, and resilient. So this, this is a a bit more abstract, but when you think about the built form and like a given commercial building, and if the global economy changes, will that particular building be adaptable to a new land use if something goes under? I grew up here and in the 90s, we had a couple factories. We had uh, Nordic Furniture and Terra Footwear and Markdale went out of business around that time. And those big, large industrial buildings sat vacant for a long time because a large industrial building is not particularly adaptable. Whereas if you look at a downtown, you got a smaller box. Those kinds of urban forms are more adaptable to change and to, to turning into a new smaller scale land use over time. Inclusive and accessible. We don't want to have barriers to having, you know, all kinds of people come to our communities. One in particular, as it relates to the built environment, is persons with disabilities. So if someone needs a, a walker or a wheelchair or a scooter, there's the, the way we make our environments, our sidewalks, our streets, the entrances to our buildings, that very much influences how inclusive and accessible the community is to those individuals. And beautiful, if you have the choice, you, you'd like your community to be better looking than rather than derelict and run down. And wealthy, wealthy doesn't mean you want everyone in your community to be just rich people, but you want those pe the people in your community to be as rich as they can be. You want them to be successful. You want them to have opportunities. 
You want the financial position of the municipality to be strong so that it can provide all of the important community services that it provides to us in perpetuity, our roads, our sewers, our parks, our arenas. The municipality takes care of those things and the way we lay out our community physically influences the financial position of the municipality. So if you have a whole ton of roads with large buildings that relatively pay less tax along the same frontage of road as, for example, a downtown with a whole bunch of different buildings, which with a high density of tax revenue, the municipality won't be in as strong of a financial position because you're going to be re uh, repairing all of that infrastructure without the sufficient revenue of building or property to tax along that, that frontage of infrastructure. And when we think about those things, I'd like to show a couple images of places, you know, here's a community, does it possess those various attributes? It might have some of them. I would argue it probably doesn't have all of them. I don't know how adaptable it is. It's just residential. This is kind of all it can be or how accessible it is. Can you live here if, if you're not wealthy? Uh, can you can you walk to anywhere from here or do you need to own a car? These are kinds of things we should think about as we're looking at different urban forms. This is the east side of Owen Sounds, the Walmart and Home Depot parking lot there. This is and there's kind of those other ones on the, the northern end of that parking lot. And that's what it looks like on the ground. And when we look at this, do we think, you know, is this a beautiful place? Is this an adaptable place? I don't know if the Walmart goes out of business, how easy it will be for a new company to come in that might sit there vacant for a while. If everything that we have ends up looking like this, how adaptable and resilient is our community going to be? Or how accessible is this place? Can you get to this place without a car? Is it a safe place to go to? If you're not in a car, for example, I would argue it's not particularly easy to get there. Um, and these places, it's fine for them to exist. But when we're thinking, you know, where is this appropriate? Should everywhere look like this? Or should some places look like this? And this is downtown Walkerton, very similar to parts of downtown Markdale. This is what it looks like from above. It's a much different picture. It's, it's in my opinion, much more adaptable, much more resilient. It's more accessible and pedestrian friendly. Um, it's safer, arguably, if you're on your feet, walking to and from different businesses here. These are things to think about when we're thinking what we want our community to look like through our zoning bylaw. And here's an example from Markdale of what I think is a, a building that kind of represents all those attributes in a positive way. I think this is a, a great looking building downtown. It's the old fire hall. It's now Maryland's restaurant. It's obviously adaptable. It's been changed from its original purpose into a, a restaurant now. Um, I would argue it's wealthy. It does it, it fills the entire frontage that it, it consumes with building. The, the tax density is probably ideal for this structure. Uh, and um, it's, a, it's a nice place to be. And when we look across the street, when we see this blank canvas here in our downtown Markdale, it's like, what do we want this to look like? Should it look more like Maryland's? Should it look, look more like more of this? Or is it going to look more like this, more new commercial development that's dominated primarily by parking? And these are important things to think about when we're thinking what goes in our zoning bylaw, when we plan in general, what do we want our community to look like? So some common incorrect assumptions of why we plan. And these are important to keep in mind as we go through the zoning bylaw process. This is these um, concerns right here probably dominate what most people come out in when they express their concerns on any given planning application. The, these are kind of at the forefront for the most part. And there's there's a understanding in the public that these these are these are the things that should be considered and it's it's a misunderstanding. So number one, we do not plan to prevent certain types of people from living somewhere or doing something. It is not a legitimate public interest concern to prevent a, a person based on their their race or religion or whatever from doing a particular land use on the basis of those other things and this is actually some of the origins of zoning bylaws come from this place in the early 1900s many cities throughout the united states passed ordinances that 
certain neighbor, uh, they could they couldn't evict people from their homes, so they passed ordinances to enforce segregation, saying white people can't move to majority black neighborhoods and black people can't move to majority white neighborhoods. And these became very popular throughout the states over the, the early 1900s until the Supreme Court struck those down as being not legitimate. And they're not legitimate. And these types of concerns, though, they still they still arise today, particularly in relation to things like apartments or low income housing, where people express concerns about not wanting to live near someone because they're they're low income. Uh, that's not a legitimate planning concern. That's not why we plan. The next most popular one is to protect property values. And this is also some of the origins of zoning bylaws. They came into play to enforce, uh, you know, that you couldn't have certain things in a certain neighborhood because then it wouldn't, so you couldn't bring in an industrial use into an established residential neighborhood and lower your property value. That was kind of the uh, initiative behind passing zoning bylaws. And there's legitimate public interest concerns with that example, but protecting property value is not one of them. So people come forward with this concern all the time and say, I don't want this thing next to me. It's going to make my property value go down. It's a legitimate concern to have as an individual, but it is not something that comes into planning consideration when we're talking about an overall public interest. The next one is to make sure that the neighborhood in general is okay with changes to private property. Um, the, the framework is not here. We have public meetings to keep everyone informed so that everything is above board, but going through these processes where we decide what is going to be permitted where is not meant to be a means to say we're going to have a census to get every single person in the neighborhood to vote and agree that they're okay and comfortable with something before proceeding we have to be looking at the public interest element there and assessing that element it's a good to get involved and be informed but just be aware that there's not just a general vote for everyone has to be okay with something and that's why we're planning the next one to make sure that things stay the way they are today there's there's merit to not having radical changes you know again that the residential established neighborhood and then you're knocking down some houses and putting up a factory that is a stark change but a residential neighborhood then evolving into some duplexes and triplexes and even apartment buildings just because that's different than what's today does not mean that it is inappropriate or that that's why we have planning controls to prevent anything from changing ever. That's not why we plan. We plan so that we can manage that change in an appropriate way to uphold the public interest. And the next one that comes up now, every now and then is to limit competition from existing businesses. So if a new restaurant is coming to town and an established restaurant says, hey, that shouldn't go there because uh, you know I'm a restaurant and I don't want to compete and they're going to take business from me. Well, that's not a legitimate planning concern. That's a, that's a free market enterprise concern as a private matter. That is not why we plan. We're planning based on the land use. Is it appropriate in that area based on certain criteria? So what is the zoning bylaw? And in, in Ontario, zoning bylaws are passed by lower tier municipalities, so like Grey Highlands, and typically consist of a, a few elements. So there's a list of defined terms. And these terms are important because they'll get used over and over again throughout the bylaw, but it's whatever it says in the definition is what that term actually is. So a single detached dwelling in Grey Highlands might have a subtle nuance versus a single detached dwelling in Chatsworth. It depends on exactly what the definition says within the zoning bylaw. There's also a set of zones with specific provisions, so rules that apply to all uses within each zone. So you have your standard residential, commercial, and things like that. There will be a section uh, for the, that zone that then describes the general provisions that apply to the uses in that zone. So the setbacks, the height, and so on and so forth, which uses are permitted in those zones. There's a set of maps to illustrate which properties the zones applied to. So the, the text isn't fully useful until you know where it's applying to. That's where the map comes in and there will be different colors and uh, symbols to differentiate each of those zones. There's then general provisions that apply to all uses in all zones. So one example would be most zoning bylaws have a provision that says you can't develop on a lot unless it has frontage on an improved public street. So that means a street that's assumed and maintained by a municipality or other government entity for the most part. You'll then have specific provisions that apply to specific uses. So an example would be um, 
a short-term accommodations in, in the new zoning bylaw, for example, have a, a specific use provision. So if you're going to be, if the residential zone says a short-term accommodation is a permitted use, you still then have to go to the short-term accommodation section to know the specific provisions that apply to that permitted use. There are also holding provisions that prohibit a permitted use until such time that a particular condition is met. So one example uh, would be applying a hold, holding provision to lands that have been recently approved for a plan of subdivision to say, you know, this is all zoned for residential, but you can't issue permits until water and wastewater capacity has been confirmed and allocated. So that means that the water uh, tower and the wastewater plant have enough capacity to process the, the delivery of the water and the processing of the effluent from that number of houses. Here's an example of some clips from the current zoning bylaw. So this pink area is, is down, this is marked out that the pink is all zoned commercial, downtown commercial. There's a list of permitted uses. So you would then go to retail commercial, you go to the definition section to see what that means. Then you would know that that is a permitted use. And then there's the zone provisions that say, you know, how big the lot has to be, what the setbacks are for a building and how tall it can be. So a zoning bylaw is a regulatory document, unlike an official plan. An official plan provides general planning guidance, what uses should go where, how you should lay out roads, so on and so forth. But the official plan provisions don't actually matter until they, be, they come into implementation through the zoning bylaw. So if the zoning bylaw permits something that is prohibited or not listed as a permitted use in the official plan, that use is still permitted today. You can go and do that use. Vice versa, if the zoning bylaw doesn't permit something that is permitted by the official plan, you still can't do that thing until you amend the zoning bylaw to permit that use in compliance with the direction of the official plan. So the zoning bylaw applies to anyone wanting to do anything today. Any new use that doesn't comply with the zoning bylaw can be shut down and it, the, the landowner can be fined until they shut down that use. You have to comply with the zoning bylaw to have a legal land use. It applies to building permit issuance. So you can't get a building permit if your proposed structure or land use does not comply with the zoning bylaw. And this has a huge functioning on the impact, uh, sorry, a huge impact on the functioning of the economy and on private property rights. Because if there's a law in place saying you can't do something, well, you can't really do that thing. And if you're being too restrictive, you're going to stifle a lot of things that people could be doing to be innovative and, and benefiting their community, being entrepreneurs and so on and so forth. You can permit anything uh, as of right that is permitted by the official plan. So the official plan can say in a neighborhood designation, you can do all kinds of things. The zoning bylaw doesn't necessarily permit all of the things that the official plan says are generally permitted. It would permit a sub, a lot of the time it permits a subset of those things and certain more intensive uses would then need a, still a zoning amendment to be able to do a thing that the official plan says you, you can and should still be able to do. So in those scenarios, when someone wants to do a land use that is permitted by the official plan that isn't permitted by the zoning bylaw, the official plan, the zoning bylaw can and should be amended if the OP provides that direction. A zoning bylaw must comply with the direction of the official plan. So if the official plan says you can't do something, and someone applies for a zoning amendment or if a zoning bylaw is passed to permit something in contravention of the official plan, that's a violation. If it gets appealed, it goes to something called the Ontario Land Tribunal and that zoning bylaw will be overturned because it does not comply with the official plan. And the Planning Act provides that direction that the zoning bylaw must comply with the official plan. The zoning bylaw must, as per the Planning Act, also be updated within three years of the official plan in order to align with the official plan and provincial policy updates. The provincial policy gets updated every now and again. It's, it's not a officially structured update cycle. Official plans then have to be updated to comply with the provincial policy statement. Official plans are supposed to be updated every five years. And then the zoning bylaw is supposed to be updated three years within three years of the official plan being updated. So for this project, Zone Grey Highlands Bylaw 2004-50 is the zoning bylaw that is currently in place. It's the first consolidated Grey Highlands zoning bylaw. So prior to amalgamation, we had an Osprey, Artemisia, Euphrasia, 
and Markdale zoning bylaw. And then in 2004, the council at the time uh, initiated a consolidated zoning bylaw. So there's just one for the whole municipality. It officially came into effect in 2006. So it's now 17 years old. It's well beyond the due date for being updated. So there's a legislative mandate to do this update. And there's also a societal need to update the zoning bylaw. Things have changed since that time. There's more pressing housing needs now than there was then. Uh, there, there's stuff that should be permitted as of right in the zoning bylaw that's not currently permitted. And here's an example of what the Planning Act generally mandates in terms of the, the update cycle. So you would update your official plan um, and then immediately following the update of the official plan, ideally, you'd start updating the zoning bylaw. And that's an involved project with, with lots of public consultation, and it should take probably about two and a half years. And then you've passed that bylaw and it's implemented. And then immediately you start updating the official plan again, because by the time you finish that two and a half year project, it's been five years since you updated it last time. So the timeline for that we've done going back to that we've done two official there's a 2003 gray highlands official plan there was an amendment and an update to that in about 2010 or 2011 council updated it again in 2015 and it didn't come into effect till 2017 when the county approved it and in that time again the zoning bylaw was only consolidated once uh, the, the 2004 50 bylaw so we haven't been doing that full cycle so a little overview of the timeline, council provided direction in 2021 to start doing this project. The, there was an RFP awarded in June, 2022 for a consultant to start doing this. And about a year later, uh, we got an initial draft from them. We decided to change gears based on the, the progress at that point in time and brought it in house in November of last year came out with a new draft in April, and then we had a committee of the whole meeting in May of this year, and we had that first open house in July. And this is still the same draft that is that is out right now. I wanna remind everyone that this is a draft. This is not the final version of the bylaw. Council has not had a, a fulsome kick at the can to review all of these provisions. The public hasn't had fulsome opportunity to provide all of their comments yet. The schedules aren't out yet. I'll get into that. So the maps, I'll get into that a little bit more later. This is a draft. So we have to start from somewhere. Uh, the attempt with this draft was, you know, to address a lot of issues, but there's there's a lot of opportunity for public feedback and for, for some stuff to change depending on the will of council and feedback from the public. And where we are, we're in phase one. So we got draft one of the zoning bylaw prepared and released. We had the committee of the whole meeting. We had that initial public open house meeting. This is our virtual public open house for individuals who couldn't make that meeting. And we had a couple people ask if there could be a virtual one because they're not able to attend in person. We're hoping to get lots of feedback from the public to determine topics of interest, possibly have more in-person meetings on specific topics. We're going to consolidate public uh, feedback, present to council, and then council will likely go into a committee of the whole meeting, direct some changes to the first draft, and then we would release a second draft along with the maps, circulate to the public again. There will be lots of opportunity for the public to have more comment. Comment on the map. Uh, we're hoping to create a, an online map application where people will be able to click a dot on the map and provide feedback. You know, hey, I think there's an error here. This zone doesn't make sense. We'd take all that information, again, consolidated, presented to council. They would direct for changes on the second draft. And then we're hopefully preparing just a third and final draft. Again, doing some, some final public consultation and open house on that draft and then passing that zoning bylaw. So some mapping notes. Uh, anyone who's looked at the bylaw so far will, will know that the maps aren't out yet. Um, those are forthcoming. We needed the the hazard mapping from the, the conservation authorities before we could make those. We just recently got that information. We also wanted to get some feedback because we've done a, a fairly substantial change to the, the standard base zones in the new zoning bylaw versus the current zoning bylaw. And we wanted some feedback from the public and council before we went and changed all the mapping because there's a substantial amount of work involved in that. And if council doesn't want to proceed, with these base zones, then we would have to undo that and redo all the maps again. So again, there will be a public facing survey application so the public can audit the map. 
Um, we're hoping to have this out within the next two months, the first draft of the mapping, which again may not be final based on the feedback that we get of, of the auditing of errors from the public. Uh, and we're also going to attempt to contact property owners. So we're, we're anyone who's getting a substantial zone change, there's some properties out there that have odd zoning that we've we've found that we don't think is appropriate based on the official plan designation or even based on what is currently appears to be on that property and it'll be changed or proposed to be changed to something else and when it's resulting in someone's rights decreasing so they're going let's for example they're going from an industrial zone in rockland to residential because there's a house on the property and nothing else uh, we're going to send mail to that person to say hey we're, we're doing this change to your property please let us know if you think this is an issue we don't think the zoning that you have right now makes makes sense so there's going to be an attempt to reach out to those people most people won't get that most people are going from residential to residential full services if you're in markdale residential to residential private services if you're in eugene if you have well and septic and you're currently residential and so on and so forth like your your zone uh, provisions and what you are permitted to do is likely going to marginally increase and just be a, a port of one of the old zone to the new zone. And here's an overview of how that port is generally working. Danielle, are you able to see my mouse on the screen? Yes, I am. Excellent. Thank you. So the new zones are on the left, the current zones are on the right. The residential zone is being split into three different zones based on the services, the municipal services that are available in terms of water and wastewater. The current residential zone already does this within the residential zone itself. So it has three different sets of provisions based on whether or not you have water and sewer or just sewer or neither of them. You have, you have well and septic. And no one can tell when just looking on the map what the situation is underground. We then have to consult other maps of the buried infrastructure. So the proposal is to just change the zone to reflect what is buried underground. So it's immediately obvious to the landowners and administrators what the zone provisions are on the basis of servicing. That one is fairly simple. Residential multiple will be split into two zones depending on what is currently on the property. Residential multiple won't be applied to anything that isn't currently residential multiple. So if it's a town home, it's going to be RM1. And if it's some other form of residential multiple, like an apartment, it'll be RM2. Um, a little caveat to that, there's some RM zones out there that are in uh, without full services. So RM for a non-townhouse should really only be applied on full services unless a site-specific amendment has been done to demonstrate adequate private servicing on a site. For those kind of outliers, again, we're probably going to reach out to someone by mail potentially designate them to be down zoned to residential private and then based on whatever is existing we might come up with a site specific exemption for a residential multiple zone residential shoreline is effectively unchanged it's it's going over to residential shoreline a exception to this is some people have residential shoreline zoning when they're in the agricultural or rural designation outside of the official plan outside of the inland lakes and shoreline designation those properties will be changed to agricultural uh, the commercial zone uh, downtown commercial is turning into commercial downtown which is a very similar zone there's a lot more uses that are going to be permitted as of right in terms of commercial uses and mixed uh, mixed use residential uses in flesherton the downtown commercial zone will become commercial village which is a very similar zone it just has lesser as of right so that means just permitted as of right permissions for residential uses and again that's based on flesherton not having full municipal services it only has municipal sewer so it's not uh, appropriate to just blanket permit 
unlimited density residential uses as an apartment uh, because this the servicing might not be there in terms of water. So it limits the the permitted residential uses as of right. Um, but there would be opportunity to permit more on a, on a site specific basis through an amendment. The highway commercial zone disappears. It turns into commercial general uh, because it doesn't have to be used just on highways. It's just a bit of a naming thing. For the most part, those uses are, are increasing a little bit. The neighborhood commercial is an existing zone that doesn't get used very often. It's, it's more of a site-specific basis that it's been used. Those will either be converted to commercial village, depending on what the current use is, or commercial rural. And the commercial rural zone is a it, different than the current rural commercial zone. It doesn't permit anything as of right. There will need to be site specific provisions to specify exactly the current use on the property as being a permitted use. And this will be used for things that exist now that generally wouldn't be permitted as a new use under the official plan. So an example would be the Chapman's Distribution Center on Highway 10. That's a, it's an older use. It's permitted. It's allowed to continue. Something like that today would be directed to a settlement area like Markdale or Flesherton, but it still exists. So we have to allow it to continue and give it permissions to recognize that so it doesn't need a, a variance every time it needs to to you know, build an overhang over the door or something like that. The I'm going to skip the commercial, the rural commercial zone for a second. The recreation resort zone parts of that will be turned into commercial resort village, which has very similar uses to the recreational resort zone. It functions very similar to a commercial downtown zone. That is generally the direction of the official plan for that designation. There's a handful of properties that have that around Talisman and Beaver Valley Ski Club. Uh, there's lots of opportunity to, for people to provide comment on that. Uh, and some of those properties that are currently zoned recreational resort will just be zoned to residential because they are smaller lots that are currently purely residential. So an example would be the Amex subdivision north of the, the former Talisman Ski Hill. Uh, other employment zones, light industrial and heavy industrial are being collapsed into one industrial zone. The light industrial zone doesn't get used very often, uh, and the instances of it are probably they shouldn't have blanket light industrial pr provisions. So a lot of these properties that are zoned light industrial will actually end up being commercial rural with site specific provisions to recognize whatever exists today. Um, MEX extractive industrial is effectively the same It's industrial extractive and institutional still institutional. The next one is where a lot of stuff is changing. So the rural residential zone, the rural commercial zone, the agriculture zone, the restricted agriculture zone and the rural zone all form kind of the five main zones in what I call the countryside. So the areas outside of settlement areas. And these are all going to get collapsed into one agricultural zone. And this is because the, there's not really an official plan directive to have these different zones and having the different zones prevents barriers to people to just doing things that the official plan says they should be allowed to do. So the rural residential zone, for example, is only ever applied after a property is severed in the rural designation where severances are permitted. It then has to be zoned to rural residential because of a, the minimum lot restriction of the rural zone. The rural zone has a minimum lot size requirement of 20 hectares or 50 acres. Someone severs off a two acre lot, which the official plan allows. Well, then they have to rezone to rural residential because it has a smaller minimum lot size. But that's unnecessary as per the official plan because the official plan already dictates what the minimum lot size has to be. It doesn't need to be in the zoning. And then the rural residential zone just takes away permissions for those properties to do agricultural uses, which the official plan would still let you do on a smaller lot. So that zone becomes unnecessary. If you just get rid of the minimum lot size and have it one zone with no minimum lot size, you still need to comply with the official plan for severance requirements. And then you avoid the need for the zoning amendment when you, when you have a permitted severance in a rural designation. This doesn't mean you can sever an agricultural designation. So there's two different designations in the official plan for anyone who's ever inquired about a severance. You can't do 
two acre lots in an agricultural designation that is not changed by removing the minimum lot size requirement in a single agricultural zone. Currently, the agriculture zone and the rural zone, the only differentiators between the two is the minimum lot size with the agriculture zone having a 40 hectare or 100 acre minimum and the rural again having a 50 acre minimum, which again, if we're just referring to the official plan for direction for severances, that becomes unnecessary so we can get rid of that. The only other differentiator is the rural zone doesn't permit intensive livestock operations, which is something that's defined within the current bylaw. It's kind of arbitrarily defined. It's a practice that was popular many decades ago that the Ontario Ministry of Food and Agriculture Affairs highly discourages people from doing because they already have another mechanism called minimum distance separation requirements that solves that issue of livestock separation from houses. So it imposes a minimum setback between a new livestock operation and an existing house and vice versa. Those rules still apply. There's no need to limit rural lands from being used from intensive livestock operations. Restricted agriculture is the same as rural. It, it just limited intensive livestock operations relative to the agriculture zone. So those ones can all go away. And then the last one is the C4 zone, which many people might be familiar with. Shops are the most uh, common use in those zones. The official plan says you should just be able to do a shop. Uh, you don't actually have to do it through a zoning amendment. So this removes the need for an amendment. It follows the official plan direction to permit these uses. And then all of the size provisions that are currently in place in the current C4 zone are just going to be embedded in the new agriculture zone for a, a, a shop use and on-farm diversified use. So that the size of the shop doesn't change, the end result doesn't change. We just avoid doing 20 site-specific amendments for new shops every year. And the, the same end result is, is there on the ground at the end of the day. So this removes a whole bunch of severance applications and zoning amendment applications results in effectively the same end results other than uh, what rural residential properties will now get a little bit of increase in permission because they'll be able to uh, do agricultural activities. Again, it doesn't mean you can necessarily put a barn on an undersized lot because you're still going to have to comply with minimum distance separation requirements. The other zones are generally unchanged. Hazard is hazard. You still can't do stuff in hazard. Wetland is wetland. You can't do stuff in wetland open space is open space, those are parks. The development zone becomes future development just so that it more appropriately articulates what it is meant for. So this is a zone that effectively doesn't allow you to do anything until you do a zoning amendment to properly rezone your land. This is generally applied to large properties on the fringe of a settlement area so that someone doesn't plunk something in the middle of it and make it harder to do proper greenfield development at the edge of town. There's also a new parking zone that can be used to uh, zone in specific parking lots and no development zone is going to be going away um, and replace. So everything that it currently has no development, we're going to look at on a site specific basis and impose a holding provision as necessary. So for the most part, no development zones are used to restrict development out of an area that's a, a core natural heritage area or it has karst or something like that. And we have other mapping from the county official plan and we can put an overlay on say the agricultural zone and say you still can't build in this area even though it's owned agriculture until you do whatever condition is imposed by this overlay through the hold. And so here's an example of the agriculture, restricted agriculture, rural, rural residential and rural commercial zones. Now and in the new zoning bylaw, this will all be one brown color, it'll be agriculture, and the green will still be green, that is hazard. So all five of those zones turn into one zone. So the objectives with the first draft is to incorporate the Planning Act amendments. So there's been some changes by the province to the Planning Act to mandate that zoning bylaws permit certain things. Those are getting formalized in this bylaw to comply with the official plan. So the county and Gray Highlands official plan and provincial policy statements as is required. To clarify some definitions, the current bylaw has some definitions that are confusing or maybe lacking some clarity in, in certain areas that makes it hard to administer. So we're trying to solve some of those problems. To create a document that's understandable and, and simple to, to navigate. So the flow of this document has been improved a bit. Uh, there's kind of a, as you scroll down, it, that's kind of the direction you should be reading the bylaw rather than hopping around so much like the current bylaw. 
uh, to upzone where possible, so to increase permissions a little bit where, wherever is reasonable to improve adaptability, productive, productivity, and inclusiveness. So particularly in the downtown, the, the permissions are going to be expanded. Parking has a big impact on this, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. To downzone where necessary, again, those weird properties, they have to be downzoned as per the policy framework, we will do so. And there's some holding provisions for things like natural heritage features that are directed by the county official plan that, that need to be applied to some extent. There's some latitude there for, for council to decide which way they want to go. To enable walkability and financial sustainability, again, this one is, is largely to do with parking and permitting mixed uses in the downtown zone. To accept uncertainty, so this kind of relates to up zoning. Like, we can't always have to zone in every every single new activity that comes to town. You can permit a lot of things as of right that are reasonable in a downtown area, and just accept that there might be some minor annoyances with those things. But there, there's a lot more benefits to come by by permitting those things as of right, as they allow our economy to be more adaptive and, and robust. To improve the effectiveness, efficiency, and fairness of the planning system, and this is this is mostly to do with consolidating those zones to get rid of the need for uh, so many amendments that are already, the end result is already permitted by the official plan, and we do the same thing over and over again. So eliminating those processes, those planning approval processes, uh, is, is more fair to landowners and applicants. It's more efficient. And it, it ends up with the same end result with, with less effort spent getting to, getting to that point. And then to balance property rights with the public interest. So again, trying to permit people to do a, a couple more things than they're permitted to do today while still ensuring the public interest is maintained. So for the role of staff, just for clarity for everyone, we draft the bylaw. Our job is to understand the Planning Act, its direction and what constitutes good planning to inform and educate council and the public of the rules, the objectives and the process, to respond to questions from council and the public, to document responses from the public, please provide those. Incorporate valuable public feedback into draft revisions. So if there's good ideas that come from the public, please bring those forward. I'd, I'd be glad to, to take those uh, into consideration in a report to council for a revision and then to make recommendations to council. What we can't do, I don't ultimately dictate what goes in this bylaw. So don't think just because this draft is out here, out there that, that we put forward that that is the absolute end point. Um, there is opportunity to provide your feedback. I can't recommend incorporating changes to the bylaw uh, that are suggested by members of the public if I don't agree with those changes. So you are free to, to provide your opinion and your letters and we will articulate those uh, suggestions to council, but it does not necessarily mean that we will recommend that they implement that suggestion. Uh, except for known errors, take requests to apply specific zoning to specific properties. So this is not the project or the opportunity if, if you want to do some expansive commercial opportunity on your residential property to reach out and say, hey, can I get commercial zoning instead? That's not what we're doing here. We're applying a, a structured rezoning or, or shift of, of the zones uh, based on the planning framework. There are known errors, like we've had people reach out over the last few years with known zoning errors uh, that are we can tell because a previous bylaw zoned it a different way, and then this most recent zoning bylaw zoned it uh, another way and then the new way that currently is in place doesn't make sense those things will be cleaned up but uh, that that's fixing an error that is not just taking a special request to apply new zoning to a property so this is i'm going to go through a summary of some of the substantial changes so one is the zone overhaul we kind of went over that already that was the table that i showed there's also within those new zones there's modified setbacks frontage lot coverage and minimum lot area requirements some of those have been changed some of those haven't uh, if, if people have strong opinions on those things it would be great to hear them if, if someone has great justification for what they should or shouldn't be please bring those comments forward and there's modified permitted uses in all of these zones so most zones add permissions relative to the current bylaw. There's a lot of, of permitted uses and zone provisions in the different zones and everyone needs to review those in detail if they want to understand them. I'm not going to go through all of them. That will take a very long time. 
There's an overhaul to the definition. So important ones are agriculture related use. So this is a new definition that's directly related to the official plan. There's uh, important provisions for everyone to review. So this is gonna permit some stuff as of right in the agriculture zone that's not currently permitted. These are not arm farm diversified uses. So these aren't the standard shops that many people might be familiar with. Um, and these uses will have a, a larger permitted gross floor area than the shops. The shops are limited at 250 square meters and the proposed bylaw uh, agriculture related uses are 750 square meters. And that the official plan for clarity doesn't provide a maximum floor area limit for agriculture related uses currently. Uh, dwellings, there's a, a total overhaul of dwelling definitions that everyone should, should be aware of, um, and this is to help implement the provincial direction, and I'll get into that a little bit later in terms of triplexes on a lot. Um, home industry, large and small, so we already have a home industry definition where you can have a, yeah, like a carpenter shop or an electric electrician shop in a rural a residential or agriculture rural zone. And it's, max, it's maximum floor area is 60 square meters. The, that's going to be called a small home industry now, and it's being increased to 100 square meters. Most zoning bylaws have a 100 square meter limit for, for that uh, home industry use. And then large home industry is the phrase that's being used to refer to the, the C4 shops that everyone is, is familiar with. And those will only be permitted still on lots that are 20 hectares or larger. And the small home industry can be permitted on, on any agricultural zoned lot. Italics are used throughout for defined terms. There's a few more uses here that are you know, less uh, influential perhaps than those first few. So agricultural uses, it's been expanded a little bit for anyone in the agricultural zone should familiarize themselves with that. Brewery and microbrewery have been added. Business office has been used, has been more generalized to refer to a broader scope of, of professional service-based business. Uh, street definitions have been added for things like street line and connecting link. These are more administrative uh, definitions. Drive-through service facilities have been defined and are specifically not permitted in the downtown zone. Industrial use, the term has been is much broader. Uh, anyone interested in the industrial zone should familiarize himself with that use. A sensitive receptor has been added. So in a new industrial use would still have to have a certain setback from a sensitive receptor, an existing sensitive receptor, such as a house. Short-term accommodations have been defined uh, for clarity. Um, as they're not currently defined in the bylaw, they're kind of just treated as a single detached dwelling. And a service shop has been more generalized. So these are service-based businesses such as, as a hairdresser and so on. Um, they're, they're much more, the definition is broader to refer, refer to a greater scope of these sorts of businesses. Site plan control, any reference to this has been deleted from the zoning bylaw. So for anyone who's ever gone through that, uh, it's, it's directed more at commercial developments. It's a more involved planning review process before a building permit gets issued. The current bylaw, zoning bylaw, subjects a lot of uses to site plan control, which is not the correct way to do it. The, the municipality has a separate site plan control bylaw that needs to subject to specific uses to site plan control. And there shouldn't be any references in the zoning bylaw to say which uses are or are not subject to site plan. So in parallel to this process, we're going to bring forward a the site plan control bylaw update to provide a little more clarity there because our current bylaws is, is pretty light on in terms of direction and what uses should and shouldn't be uh, subject to site plan. Fourplexes. So the province passed a, um, an amendment to the Planning Act that permits triplexes on all fully serviced residential lots. So in Markdale and Amick, where we have municipal water and sewer, you are now allowed a triplex on a lot. It doesn't matter that the zoning bylaw says you can only have a single detached dwelling. That's a planning act amendment that overrode everyone's zoning bylaws. So the new zoning bylaw is going to align with this. It's also proposing that you can have a fourplex on a fully serviced lot. Um, that doesn't need to happen. Uh, council can decide if they want to go up to a fourplex or just keep the triplex as per the Planning Act amendment. Uh, and there's there's certainly room for, for feedback on that. 
Additional dwelling units, this is another thing from Bill 103. So on a fully serviced residential lot, everyone is permitted to have an additional dwelling unit in an accessory structure. So you can you can not only have a triplex, you can have a, a duplex with an, a, a detached additional dwelling unit, or you can have a single detached dwelling with a detached dwelling unit, which we already allow the first version of that, or sorry, the, the single detached dwelling with the additional dwelling unit. The new zoning bylaw aligns better with the uh, the amendments to the Planning Act by the province. It also proposes uh, to permit mobile homes as additional dwelling units. There's a, a bit of a hang up currently in the official plan that kind of says you can't uh, use mobile homes for any use. When you read the definition of mobile home, it kind of defines it based on it's it's fabricated off site and transported to site. And there's all kinds of new fabricated homes that meet that definition of mobile home that aren't permitted. Um, there's an opportunity here for, for council to mull over this. There's a lot of people who, who want these homes that are currently not allowed to have them as per our current zoning bylaw. So the new zoning bylaw is proposing some changes to that. Um, and yeah, there's lots of room for public feedback on this. There's there's this is not all set in stone here. This is kind of some, a lot of people are, are generally interested in this. So if you have strong feelings one way or the other about what should or shouldn't be permitted in terms of additional dwelling units, please provide your comments. Here's kind of a visual of, of what the new bylaw would permit. So the one on the left is a duplex with a detached additional dwelling unit. The new bylaw proposes to permit that. It proposes to permit a fourplex. And again, this is in the residential full services zone, not the partial services zones or private services. The one on the right though would not be currently permitted under even the proposed new provisions. So to have four units, but in two separate structures and you know, there's latitude to permit that. So feedback, feedback is appreciated on that. Accessory buildings, there's been uh, some changes to make these a little bit easier, a little bit looser for people to do some certain things. So permitted, uh, it can be permitted closer to the front lot line in the agricultural zone. Currently, you can only do that if your lot is at least 15 hectares. This is just saying if you're in the ag zone. So again, anything in the countryside, you'd be allowed a detached garage closer to the front lot line than the house. Uh, some clarification on what you can have in an accessory building what can be built prior to a dwelling in the agricultural zone. So right now you can't build an accessory structure prior to a main building, but there's some clarity that, you know, a barn would qualify as a main building or be permitted before a house on an agricultural lot. It's clarification on what a bunkie is and a cabin and that both are permitted subject to certain provisions. A maximum lot area can be 80% of the gross floor area of a main building or 5% of the lot, whichever is greater. Currently, you're limited to 5% of the lot outright. So in town, that becomes a very restrictive uh, requirement on smaller lots. This would say you could have more lot coverage for an accessory structure on smaller lots effectively. And then the height is proposed to be increased to eight meters in the residential zones. And there's there's room for, for suggestions on this too. Again, we went over the home industry uh, thing already. That's a, a fairly substantial change. Um, there are some, so again, since the C4 zone is going away and they're gonna be permitted as of right, there are a whole bunch of provisions that would still apply to the home industry being permitted as of right. So it still has to have a certain setback from a neighboring house. The lot has to be 20 hectares. The use still has to be 250 square meters and so on. And that's all laid out in the bylaw. Home businesses, more floor areas permitted for home business. This would be in like a residential zone if you're whatever, a lawyer running your business out of your house uh, or you're cutting hair or whatever. Uh, you could have it in an accessory structure. They're currently not permitted in an accessory structure. So technically, if you were to build like a shed in your backyard and have your home office in there as a lawyer, that wouldn't be allowed right now. Uh, this is proposing that you could do that. It's a broader scope of uses that would be permitted as a home business. So again, service shop and business office, which have been broadened in scope, those would be permitted. Child care centers can be a home business and are permitted in most zones. Uh, urban agriculture is added as a concept. So this is saying you could have a little mini nursery, you could grow some vegetables or whatever in your yard and you could sell them even if you live in Markdale. 
um, resource-based recreation. So these are like campgrounds. Uh, the proposal is to not permit these as of right in any zone. There's some guidance in there of what would be required to permit one of these. And the official plan already provides some framework for this, but there's just some clarity to say, you'd have to amend the zoning bylaw on a site-specific basis to permit these uses. They're not permitted as of right. Renewable energy, Grey Highlands already has a very extensive section on this in the zoning bylaw. It has been pared down in the new zoning bylaw to simplify it. Things have changed since the Green Energy Act went away. Um, it permits kind of a small turbine and a one small ground mounted solar panel as of right in the agriculture zone. It permits solar panels on roofs and any legal building. Uh, and then if you're doing a solar farm or a wind farm, you would you would need a zoning bylaw amendment. You would not be permitted to do that as of right. Minimum distance separation. This is the setback between livestock barns and existing dwellings and vice versa. Uh, it's not currently applied to new dwellings on existing lots in Grey Highlands. That's in contravention to the provincial policy statement and the official plan. It must be applied to all new dwellings on lots created after 2017 and then all new barns. And the provincial guideline generally uh, encourages you to do it for any new dwelling, regardless of when the lot is created. Um, so then if you get hung up, you can't meet MDS, you would, you'd theoretically on an existing lot of record, you could potentially still permit that. Again, if it was permitted, if the law was created prior to 2017 through an amendment or a minor variance or something like that. Um, the draft bylaw proposes that home industries that permitted as of right would not be subject to MDS. The official plan actually says they, they have to be, uh, but this is more restrictive than what the provincial guideline requires and it causes some problems. So we have fairly often where uh, an existing accessory structure goes to get converted into a shop and that structure is too close to a barn and then it doesn't meet MDS and they need a variance and council's granted or your committee has granted variances or, or minor or, uh, zoning amendments for this because those uses don't really conflict with uh, livestock barns because uh, they're, they're kind of industrial in nature. Again, the province doesn't require you to do that. It's more meant for if you're if you're doing a non-farm diversified use as a restaurant or something, that should still uh, comply with MDS. So this has to be discussed by council, um, whether or not they want to do this and amend the OP, the official plan in parallel to do to permit these without requiring MDS, or if they want to maintain what's in the, the official plan and subject everything to MDS and do zoning amendments as, or variances as needed. Then there's holding provisions. So these are, again, these are an overlay. So you might be zoned agriculture or, or residential or whatever. At particular in the agricultural zone, there's a whole bunch of natural heritage features. There's wetlands, there's significant woodlands, there's core natural heritage areas. And these have certain rules under the official plan that might require an environmental impact study before uh, development can be done within or next to those areas. And a holding provision would zone those lands as agriculture, so you could still do all those uses, but actually you can't do them until the hold is removed and the condition of removing the hold would be doing that environmental impact study, for example. And there's latitude here for exactly how restrictive council wants to be. This will be important for when the maps are released for everyone to fully understand how this will be applied. So stay tuned for the maps on how specifically these will be implemented. And then there's parking. So there's reduced minimums proposed in the draft. Um, I've written a, a long report that's on the website for this project about how we should eliminate parking requirements entirely because they are arbitrary and they don't really result in the uh, outcomes that they intend to achieve. And they cause a whole bunch of problems uh, related to those community desirable community attributes that I spoke to earlier. And when you look at kind of this visual, you can see if you're on a vacant site, what you actually have to do to comply with most parking requirements. So the buildings that are, are representative of a downtown environment, you can never build that environment while complying, while providing parking on site. It's just not possible. So to say we need parking spaces for any given land use is like saying we wish our downtown looked instead like this or like one of these other pictures on the side. It's it's saying we don't want to replicate the built form of downtown anywhere. And what that results in is you having to drive everywhere for everything and not being able to participate in society without a car. 
It prevents housing from getting built from not having minimum parking requirements. It prevents new land uses from occupying an existing building for, for not meeting the minimum parking requirements. It becomes a very large hindrance and results in a whole bunch of invisible societal costs. And if you want more information, you can read the paper. It goes into a lot of detail on this. Um, but that's, again, that's one of the proposed changes. And here's just a visual example of what a parking minimum resulted in in Markdale alone. So the West Main Street West is on the top. Those buildings are all 100 years old or so. And then Main Street East on the bottom, those were built following the first uh, Markdale zoning bylaw, which then imposed a minimum parking requirement. You got a much different built form between having minimum parking requirements and not having them. The most noticeable being, noticeable being you don't get a second story because it goes by uh, the gross floor area of the building and you just you can't fit the number of parking spaces that are needed once you add another story you'd have to double that footprint of the parking lot and you just don't have that space so that disappears you get very large entrances that then cause a bit of an obstruction to pedestrians who are walking through there because the cars are going back and forth uh, in and out of the parking lots rather than just parallel parking on the street and then you like here's another example of what you get uh, versus parking minimums and not having parking minimums. You have a walkable urban form on the top, so you just walk it in again, and that's Banff. And then on the bottom, that's where you get that's what that's what parking minimums result in. So some of these places on the bottom make sense depending on where it is. Obviously, if you have a Walmart, you need some parking, but do you need to have a minimum in the bylaw? Or can we leave it to Walmart to figure out how much parking they need to make their business work so that everywhere doesn't look like Walmart because we want some of our places to look like those spots at the top. There's also some clarity items that are less significant. So short-term accommodations are, uh, uh, there's a section on them for clarity again, because right now there's nothing. Uh, shipping containers, we get a lot of questions about these and the bylaws very ambiguous on them. There's proposed provisions to permit them in certain places and not in others as accessory structures. Um, room for feedback there, provide some people hate them, some people don't have a problem with them. There's not really an official plan direction on what should or shouldn't be permitted. Um, so people's voices and opinions on, on that is, is important and, and great to get. Pools and ponds, there's more clarity again to get, People will ask about ponds all the time and there's not really any guidance in the bylaw. It's very broad where you can have a pond uh, and then pools is a little bit more permissive than what's currently permitted in terms of where you have it in your yard, particularly in the countryside. Fences, there's a more clarity there because the current bylaw doesn't have very much. Site triangles and corner visibility triangles, a little bit of tinkering there. So that's a, a certain area when you're at an intersection, when you're looking left and right, the area is kind of right next to the intersection. You're not allowed to have stuff on your on your property that would obstruct a driver's vision. There's some tinkering that happened there. Kennels, there's some stock provisions there. They're not permitted anywhere as of right, but there's kind of some standard setbacks and whatnot so that it can be used when someone does a zoning amendment to permit a kennel. Refreshment vehicles, some clarity on where those can be permitted because they're not really spoken to and they're mobile. So people want to put them in all kinds of different places. And then boathouses and docks. Again, this is more clarity. Uh, the hazard zone generally covers these anyway because you're not allowed structures for the most part in the hazard zone. But there's, there's uh, some additional clarification in that specific section. So that's, I'm going to stop talking there. That's a lot of information for everyone. I'm hoping I, I answered some questions. Um, again, there's the information if you want to follow up after the meeting for with a specific inquiry or have a chat or something like that. And, and that's the zoning link. And, um, you know, anyone can reach out and ask for any of this information. And I will stop now. And Danielle, if we want to go and see if there's any questions from the public. Uh, thank you, Manager Rapke. So anyone in attendance uh, wishing to ask a question of Manager Rapke can use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate their wish to do so. Uh, if they are connected to the meeting by telephone, they can dial star nine to raise their hand. Um, I'm just going to go to the list now and I can see we have a question from Katie Lazier. Uh, Katie, I will allow you to talk. You should be able to turn on your microphone. 
Hi there. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation tonight. Really illuminating and, and great job. Lots of work, obviously. Um, I'm with uh, Protecting Talisman Lands Association, and uh, of course, we have lots of concerns. But I, I guess I just wanted to, to, to focus in on one area uh, for tonight and just get your perspective on the top of the Talisman Lands. You know, this is one thing that's changed a lot since the last zoning bylaw. And that is that we, of course, no longer have a ski hill there, haven't had one in a decade. So there is no major recreational use there. And my understanding is that the top of the lands would be designated future development. Um, and yet it's not serviced. It's miles and miles away from a town or servicing um, or the, the services of a town or a settlement area. Um, and there's no plan in the master uh, servicing plan, uh, as far as I understand, to service that area. So I don't understand why it would be designated for future development. I wonder if you could illuminate the planning rationale for that. Yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, as a starting point, that property in particular, I don't want to get too far into particular properties, but I know that this one's popular. Um, it has a special official plan designation. So we got to remember that we're amending the zoning bylaw right now and we can't, we're not redesignating something in the official plan. So it has a specific official plan designation that allows a, a pretty broad range of activities on that property. In terms of zoning, the future development zone is actually one of the most restrictive zones. The future development zone is a a way of applying in effect a holding provision but in a zone itself so then you you couldn't actually there's a, there's a subtle nuance between a lift of hold and a zoning amendment where you can't appeal a lift of hold and it's there's a much lesser threshold of things that you need to do to then be able to do the activities that are permitted in the underlying zone where so if you zone something future development it just says you can't do anything on this property other than what is currently happening and then you need to rezone it to something more appropriate as per the official plan designation when you show up when you're ready for a, a proper application <clears throat> excuse me and fulsome plan so the top area is already zoned development a lot of the most of the properties that are currently zoned development will be zoned future development which will effectively strip any rights to do anything until they do a zoning amendment an exception to that rule for development becoming future development is in some, like Eugenia has a lot of lands that are zoned uh, development, for example, that should just be residential. Those want, and they're like in town and they have houses on them. Those will be switched to residential, but the big lots with development potential will be zoned future development, which actually means they can't do anything until they show up later for an amendment. And that's what will happen on that property. Does that answer your question, Kate? So you yeah, can it does, but it, it doesn't deal with the, I guess, the fundamental disconnect between, you know, the reality of that area not having a major recreational use. And I guess this is a problem with doing the zoning bylaw so out of sync, but um we're That's, not addressing this reality on the official plan. But you know, I get your concern. It, it is an official you know, how, plan concern. It's hard to justify development there without any servicing or any plan for servicing given everything else you've said tonight and that any development there will need to do that through a site-specific application the future development zone actually makes sure that that happens again as per the official plan framework um, but in terms of why is it designated that way in the official plan i can't really speak to that i don't know i've inherited it's been like that for a long time all the way back to the 2003 official plan has almost the identical uh provisions there uh, and the justification why it's why it's still there uh, that it's in the Niagara Escarpment Plan as a special designated area, and it's kind of maintained that designation since whenever that happened. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any other questions? Uh, I'll let other people go ahead, but <laughs> I don't want to take up all your time tonight, Matt. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone else with a question? You may use the raise your hand feature.
So anyone in, in attendance who currently wishes to ask a question can use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate their wish so. If they're connected by phone, they can dial star nine to raise their hand. Uh, at this point, Manager Rapke, I'm not seeing uh, anyone uh, in attendance. Oh, there we go. We have one more here. Uh, we will go to Joyce Hall. Joyce, I will allow you to speak. You should be able to turn your microphone on. Okay, thank you. Actually, I think this question was asked at the meeting in Flesherton, and I just can't remember the answer. Um, if, if someone asked, and I'm asking now, why is the um, zoning bylaw being amended before the official plan? Um, is um, is amended because, in fact, both are kind of due for, um, you know, for amendment. Thanks, Joyce. And so it, it feels that way that it's happening before, but if back, I think in my presentation, I think I put it in, it was a new slide, it's a circle. So it's a cycle of amending the official plan and then amending the zoning bylaw. And we've done the official plan, we did it in 2003, then we did the zoning bylaw. And then we did an OP update like 2011 and an OP update 2015 slash 17. And we did no subsequent zoning amendments. So we're, we're well after the official plan. There's stuff that should also be amended in the official plan, but we need to update the zoning bylaw. And the big impact that the zoning bylaw has an, an update to that document versus the official plan is again, it applies to everything anyone wants to do today without showing up and getting special permission. So we process about 60 zoning bylaw amendments a year. We're, we have been the champ, if you wanna call it that, relative to every other municipality in the Gray County in terms of number of zoning bylaw amendments uh, for the last three years running, which is not a good crown to have because it means your bylaw is probably the most out of date because everyone else who knew half that or whatever, because they've updated their bylaw and they're therefore ending up with the same land uses and then results, but they're not having to process as many amendments, um, which again is saving landowners time and money, is saving confusion in the public, saving staff resources, and you end up with the same end result as per the official plan direction. So by by doing this housekeeping amendment, will allow people to, to do what they should be doing as per the official plan and, and more economic activity and housing and all that stuff gets to just happen without special permission. And then we still go right into the official plan. And then you come right back to the zoning bylaw, because if you make substantial updates to your official plan that provides for a whole new direction in terms of what should be permitted, then you have to you have to implement that in your zoning bylaw again to make sure it actually happens. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, it does. And I'm, I'm really appreciating the fact that there's lots of public consultation in this zoning um bylaw process and will that will the same um process uh, public input process occur during the official plan um amendments and and re revisions that would be the hope um there's again that it's i put it out to council back in may that following the zoning bylaw we should go right into that they still have to authorize that work to provide that direction uh, provided we do that, my hope would be even before releasing a draft, there would be public consultation sessions so that because an official plan is a much more higher level document because with the zoning bylaw, you already have the direction from the official plan. Um, so there'd be, you know, what are the goals of the community? And there'd be some some sessions with the public to kind of establish some of that stuff and some priorities before then even going out and drafting a document. Excellent. That would be that would be a really great, great plan to get the public involved as, um, as soon as possible. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Thanks for your question. Next, we will go to Deborah Very. Deborah, I will allow you to speak. You'll be able to turn your microphone on. Hi, Deb. How's it going? Good. How are you? Oh, sorry, Deb. Deb, you're a bit quieter. Can you get closer to your microphone? Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's a bit better. Okay, I know we've spoken in intensively about mobiles versus modular, but you really haven't touched a lot about what the new zoning bylaw is going to be doing for affordable housing that's at a crisis right now. Can you touch a little bit more on that, please? So there's only so much a zoning bylaw can do. And remember, so what a zoning bylaw does is important to keep in mind, and I, I didn't even state this. The only thing a zoning bylaw really does at the end of the day is prohibit stuff. Because if you had no zoning bylaw, you can do whatever you want. 
So in terms of enabling affordable housing, what a zoning bylaw can do is not prohibit certain types of housing <clears throat> in certain places where it's most appropriate. So the biggest example would be the, the, well, the province already did this amendment, but permitting triplexes, three units on a lot as of right on full services, that has an impact. It's just enabling more housing where it was previously prohibited. And the new bylaw again proposes to go to fourplexes. So that theoretically, you could take every lot in Markdale. Again, this is a full services thing only. And you could quadruple the number of units. And all, that can't just happen overnight. And there's servicing implications for the, the water and wastewater capacity. But that's kind of the biggest means. There's also um, the downtown commercial zone uh, permitting mixed uses as of right. So it, 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 right now, you're not really allowed apartments explicitly in the downtown zone. The new zoning bylaw would say, yeah, you can have on the ground floor commercial and however many units above uh, subject to meeting the height and setback restrictions and, and so on and so forth. And the other element, again, is removing the minimum parking requirement because you have there's there's numerous examples of where someone wants to put in. I see this all the time. Someone wants to put in an additional unit and the bylaw requires that they have an extra parking space that maybe isn't needed. And then a house doesn't get built because of that. And maybe some, especially in Markdale, a fully serviced area where you have everything you need, someone who doesn't have a car could have that unit. And it, for the most part, those are rental units. Those are the biggest ways uh, that it addresses, you know, affordability. Uh, but the other one would be if, if mobile homes were permitted, that is an affordable style of housing. Um, that there is interest for in particular in the agricultural designation and in particular as a an additional dwelling unit. I get people all the time, you know, they got grandkids or whatever, and they want to put a, a modular home or a mobile home on their property. And maybe the, the grandparent will move into it and retire there. And they're thinking about when they pass away, they're grandkid or kid won't need that unit anymore and they want to be able to sell it like all of this stuff adds up to affordability right so that would be a potential way of, of addressing affordability do you have any follow-up there Deb you're on mute sorry yeah but the thing is if you you were talking about single single family residential or in triplexes, duplexes in established areas, but what about rural hamlets? That's a great question. And the biggest barrier to permitting that stuff as of right is that septics by design, a standard septic, uh, allows nitrate to enter into the ground. And if you have certain site specific or regions like say Priceville uh, had susceptible soils to percolation of nitrate and you had too many units with too much septic going into the drinking water, there's potential that it can raise it to a threshold that is not safe for human consumption. So then we have people on septic and well, it, it creates a potential human health issue. And the government has a guideline for a mechanism for mitigating that, and, but it relates to lot creation. And there's a modeling exercise people have to go through when they're creating new lots to say, hey, we did this nitrate modeling thing. And if we assume this type of land use on a lot out the other end, uh, you can have lots that are about one acre in area with no problems. The problem is those, those uh, analyses always effectively assume that someone's having a single detached dwelling because that's effectively what is always proposed on those lots. So then if you circumvent that process by permitting three, four units on one acre in Priceville, you can potentially get a cumulative nitrate issue that you're not you're not monitoring properly and it just accumulates over time. So in order to permit multiple units on one lot, where there's no services in your Pricevilles and your Eugenias and Rocklands, you'd need to permit those things on a site-specific basis and have an engineer do an analysis as part of a zoning amendment to ensure that each new additional unit isn't going to exceed that, that threshold, unless the municipality undertook a very comprehensive study to then justify permitting it as of right, because you know we've done an analysis 
and the engineer has gone, you know, there's no way there's going to be an issue here, even with a density of, of X. But that that's a that's something that's not contemplated right now, that type of study. But any, you can't permit them as of right for that reason, is to avoid a, a potential human health issue. Well, I thank you for your time, Matt, once again, and I'm sure we'll talk soon. You're welcome. Thanks for your question. Uh, Manager Rapke next, we will go to Jane Piper. Jane, I will allow you to talk. You should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I just wanted to follow up on the maps and when they would be released, if if we could get kind of a, if you have a sense of a more precise date. I mean, you said in your own presentation that the zones only make, the text is only so useful without the maps. And um, I'm certainly finding that. So, I know you had your chart of the fact that you plan to release the maps, but I'm just wondering if you have a sense of a date for that. And as a sort of a supplementary question to that, will the mapping include hazard and wetlands as part of the mapping? Thanks for the question. Yes, it will include hazard and wetland and getting the hazard mapping has been the uh, really the, the piece that's been holding us off from really diving into working on it because the way you build them out, you, the hazards come externally from the conservation authorities. So we needed that data because then you apply it to the countryside and then you fill in the blanks from there for the agriculture. And then same with the wetland, the wetland kind of already exists and it gets plunked in. We just received that. Um, our, our junior planner, Abdullah and I are gonna work on, on building these maps ourselves. I'm hoping to have them done within two months. It depends on what comes up on our regular our work plate in terms of getting through that. And I'm, I'm hopeful that in November sometime we will have them released. Thank you. Um, and just uh, working from that, it, it, then built into that, there's an opportunity to have sort of more substantive public consultation after the maps have been released? Yes, 100%. So that's phase two. And totally anticipate a lot of feedback after getting the maps um, and there there will be more uh like public open houses like this for example but again also that public facing application i'm really hoping that uh people will take time particularly on their own property uh because everyone's interested in that to to look and make sure that there's not a glaring mistake because building the maps up through the the gis mapping exercise like there's a there's a lot of manual digitization um and potential things that can get misclicked too, right? So it's it's important to have a lot of eyes on that. Okay, and then just my final question, all to do with timing. And um, if everything were to go according to your uh, predicted schedule, when might we have a, an approved zoning bylaw? That will depend on how how much we stick precisely to the plan and how much feedback comes with the maps and um, a draft two. And then with the draft three, if council's totally comfortable with just doing three drafts and then we, we've had enough public feedback at that point, it, it all really depends on, on how involved everything is and how, how much feedback we get. I'm hopeful uh, spring, summer next year. Okay. Thank you very much. And in the meantime, anything that's submitted from anybody, any person or company or development proposal is um, judged according to the current zoning bylaw. Is that correct? So like, are you asking if someone shows up for a building permit or whatever today? Yes. Yes. It's, it's like, that's what applies to building permit issuance um, today until the new zoning bylaws in effect. Okay, thanks very much. You're welcome. Thanks for your question. Next, we will go to Kathy Little. Kathy, I will allow you to talk. You should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Hey, Kathy. Hi, Matt. Uh, thanks for your presentation and uh, thanks for your responses to my written questions uh, earlier. So um, I'm understanding that the function of the zoning bylaw is to implement the official plan. 
And unfortunately, it's just the nature of the process that there's always going to be a lag. Um, and so part of your um, task was to bring the, our um, Gray Highland Zoning Bylaw into compliance with the county official plan and the PPS. And um, so it, it appears that the exercise is, is fairly restrictive in that we have to um, adhere to those other documents. And I've seen, uh, I've done some research and looked at, um, just wondering about in our situation, if there's any opportunity to um, implement incentives into a zoning bylaw, comprehensive zoning bylaw that would um, incentivize some of the direction that um, our municipality and our council have taken in terms of um, uh, climate action. And I think also at the county level, um, while it may not be uh, regulation, it is also direction on smart growth and good, good neighborhood design. So uh, I know it's done in some places, um, but I don't know if it's possible in our situation. Would we be able to include some kind of incentivization opportunity in the zoning bylaw? What kind of um, outcomes were you, would you have in mind, Kathy, in terms of an incentive resulting in something? Um, that's a hard question. I, I think I'd have to go back and look at the climate action plan in particular and see what some of those recommendations are as far as, um, you know, incentivizing maybe not minimum requirements around walkability, green spaces, open, you know, parkland. Um, yeah, those are the ones that come, come to mind right away. A lot of those, I get what you're saying. A lot of them are best addressed by official plan policies because you can only trigger certain things on, a, on certain processes. So at a zoning level in terms of climate outcomes, Again, eliminating parking minimums improves walkability. The downtown is, our existing downtowns are examples of places that are walkable and that it benefits climate, you know, climate change mitigation because you're, you're walking instead of driving. Um, in terms of parkland dedication and how you lay out a, a site for a new build, that would be captured under site plan control. You can trigger a parkland dedication and you can trigger laying out of pedestrian walkways and things like that. The challenge is having explicit direction and from a policy framework perspective in the official plan in particular of what the objective is explicitly and the means by which you're gonna get there through site plan control. Uh, which we don't have great detail on in our official plan. It, it is kind of higher level, land use this land use is permitted in this designation and that's that's an op exercise and then a site plan control exercise to achieve a lot of those things and the zoning bylaw wouldn't necessarily result in them because again it, what the bylaw does is it it prohibits things it prohibits you from doing this and and therefore requires you to do this other thing instead uh, so that's kind of the means by which you can achieve climate outcomes through a zoning bylaw Okay, thanks for that. And um, so just to, with respect to site plan, um, is that also con uh, strictly contingent on the OP? There's under section 41, there's stuff that can be addressed by site plan control. The problem is with it's, it's like high level. It says um, access to and from highways, pedestrian pathways, uh, landscaping, which has even been adjusted a bit, garbage disposal. It's really the pedestrian pathway stuff that you're just kind of getting into. Um, but without an explicit guiding framework, it's then hard to force someone to do something outside of withholding an approval and encouraging them to do something. So it, that stuff does happen. And a lot of times people are willing to agree to, to put those things in place. But with in the absence of a structure, it's difficult to achieve a consistent desired outcome over and over again. 
Okay, thanks. Um, I uh, continue looking at that and see see um, I have found examples, so maybe I can um, send some your way. One, this one last question was about the mapping and um, are the natural heritage corridors and core areas, are they, uh, will they be on the mapping that circulated or are they on the overlay that um, the county has? They will be a holding provision. So for the most part, again, that stuff's in the countryside. So it'll be zoned agriculture, maybe hazard because some of those features go through hazard areas, maybe even wetlands. And then, so those underlying zones will be the zone, and then there will be a, a layer on, well, there will be a, a dash H, dash whatever number it is that I've assigned for the, the core area or the significant woodlands. And then it'll have a break in the egg layer. So there will be lines that then say agriculture dash H for core area, and that area will apply, correspond to those natural heritage features. And then once that stuff is out there in the maps, there'll need to be feedback uh, and there might be tinkering with the words or explicitly how those holding provisions are applied. Council will have to decide which way they want to go with that. Okay, uh, sorry, just one more question about, um, is, the, um, is the draft zoning bylaw being circulated to the county conservation authorities? Um, and will, if so, um, their responses, their comments or recommendations, will they be circulated to the public? Yeah, once we do, and if that's, they've already uh, received it and the, the conservation authorities have provided some initial feedback. But once we do our first kind of big consolidation of comments for council, prior to drafting draft two, that stuff will all be there for council and the public to see. Oh, great. Great, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for your questions. Uh, I would remind anyone in attendance uh, who wishes to ask a question of Manager Rapke to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate their wish to do so. Uh, if they are calling in by phone, they need to dial star nine to raise their hand. Uh, and Manager Rapke, next we will go to Jeanette Walter. Uh, Jeanette, I will allow you to speak. You'll just need to unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, Jeanette, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you for everything, Matt. It's very comprehensive. I have a comment and a question. So my comment is the recreation area that's proposed to be changed to commercial resort village. I think words that are put into our heads, you, you know, it conjures up an image. And I feel there's a huge disconnect between recreation area and then going to commercial resort village. You know, we think kind of Blue Mountain when we're thinking commercial resort village and that's the image that's conjured up with that wording. Whereas recreation area has a very different feel to it. Um, yeah, and so that's my comment on that. My question, is um in your opening you're saying zoning bylaws are not and then you said they're not to protect protect existing businesses so i wonder if you could talk about is this zoning bylaw then going to have anything that can help protect our downtown core and I guess, keep the proliferation of like big box stores that I think is pretty much common knowledge that are one of the big reasons why a lot of downtowns actually start to die off. Is there anything a zoning bylaw can do to help protect a downtown? So let's answer that question first and then remind me to go back to your comment if you want a response but if, in case I forget. So in terms of uh, protecting the downtown, the zoning bylaw in concert with the official, like really the official plan is what would drive that. So the let's go with the commercial general zone. I think that's what it's been called now in the new one. It's 
like so what's an example again i'm, I'm using markdale for a lot of examples because where most of the variability of zones is so uh you've got tim hortons and dollar ram on the south end they're they're commercial general and will, will become that and they're currently commercial highway commercial um that zone is only going to be applied to kind of existing commercial zones so there's not going to be uh then south of of dairy daughter we're, we're zoning a big stretch as commercial general that is currently zoned agriculture or anything like that so then the the timing or the, the means by which the proliferation of a, of a big box development would occur would be through a site-specific amendment when someone is probably at the edge of settlement area and they show up to do a zoning amendment so then they're all, you're not already not really focusing on the zoning bylaw because once you once you're doing an amendment you have a whole bunch of latitude it's like you're changing from one zone to a new zone you have a bunch of latitude to add in whatever you want that is directed and permitted by the official plan so then if the official plan says you can do all kinds of different things even if your bylaw is super structured and it's a new bylaw they can add in exceptions to add this and that and without provisions in your official plan to say we don't want things that look like this so at the edge of town we're not going to develop strip commercial development because of x y and z there's not really a policy framework to say don't do that thing so so a lot of people don't like what you've described um i wouldn't say the official plan necessarily prohibits that it doesn't encourage explicitly that design because you can have commercial look kind of all different sorts of ways like a downtown for example right but it doesn't say don't do that. So in the absence of policies in an official plan to avoid that outcome, a zoning bylaw wouldn't necessarily preclude that from happening. Does that answer that question? Yes, perfectly, thank you. Okay, and in terms of uh, <clears throat> calling a commercial resort village, I hear you, I had that exact thought when I called it that. The reason I did was because I had it somewhere else. I think I kept it kind of the same name before and I had it in other. And so if you look at the bylaw, there's a structure in terms of the tables. So there's like uh, residential zones and then there's a table and it has uh, residential, full services, private, and so on and so forth. And those are the columns. And then in the rows, it has all the permitted uses and then a bunch of X's of what's permitted and what zone. And the uh, recreation resort zone was in the other employment zone. And the table ended up being massive because it permitted a whole bunch of uses that were completely different than the uses, the, the other zones that were in that other employment zone section. And then when I looked at the commercial zones, all of the stuff that's directed by the OP is very similar to what is permitted in the downtown zone. It is a very similar zone. So even just for organization purposes, it fit there very easily. But I understand that it conjures up an image of, of, of something uh, that some people probably don't like. The official plan generally directs to permit those uses there. And I'm, I'm not glued to any of the, the entire list of uses being perfect by any means. There's probably some room for tinkering there. But I put in what I thought generally was, was provided for in the the current zone and versus the official plan with some additional clarity. So that's kind of the justification of why it ended up where it did. Okay, yeah, I understand. Don't necessarily still agree, but I understand. <laughs> and that's good. And any comments, you know, if, if people have comments of how it doesn't comply or it should do this or that instead, you know, please feel free to send those. You are welcome to send that stuff and that will be provided to council. Because I think when the whole designation and zone, how it came into being, is predicated on recreation, and now to strip that word entirely away from it, I think is a little problematic. Personally, I feel that. I hear you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for your comments. Manager Rapke, next we will go to Emmett Ferguson. Emmett, uh, I'll allow you to speak. You'll just need to unmute yourself. Hi, thanks. Uh, Manager Rapke, can you hear me? I can hear you, Emmett. How are you? 
Fantastic. I'm well, thanks very much. I uh, hope you're doing the same. I was just going to expand on a little bit of what Jeanette was just talking about, looking at the commercial resort village designation there. And it seems like maybe you've added the word village there in respect to the, the definition higher up for commercial village, uh, which seems like the village there is kind of saying that it's commerce that's happening in a village, which is perfectly natural. Whereas with the commercial resort village, in all of those cases, you suggest in the draft here that uh, it is relying on the, the fact of all of those being within the Estarman recreation areas, and as a result, fundamentally not happening necessarily in a village uh, as we would customarily define it. Uh, so that's just uh, the resort thing. I think, you know, if it was called commercial resort zoning, I think that would make some, some more sense. Perhaps um, if perhaps being a little bit less consistent with some of your earlier nomenclature, but that aside, uh, my, my other comment would just be uh, focused on the, the future development uh, designation that uh, was talked about a little earlier and the idea there that you, you basically suggest that the future development is for future growth. Uh, I'm wondering what you mean by that. Uh, it's not defined in the, the definition and um, essentially so, so why it would be preferable to use a future development uh, designation as compared to, uh, you know, sp simply placing it in some zone and placing the appropriate holds on it so that um, it can be explored and that, you know, our understanding of it may develop, but uh, we're not just saying like, it seems to me that that sort of puts the the outcome before the sort of development period where we're investigating and figuring out what what zone this should be put in at the end of the day, if that makes sense. That no, fair enough, Emmett. So it's it's a practice that is used in a lot of places, and it is, in all honesty, a little bit lazy. But an example would be. Uh, if, if you're familiar with the Loon Call property at the northeast end of Markdale that just got rezoned, just got approved for a plan of subdivision, it's a huge property at the fringe of a settlement area. If that were zoned, if we rewound the clock for prior to Loon Call applying for anything, and it had the future development zoning, so at the official plan level, it's designated neighborhood which permits all kinds of broad residential and you know neighborhood commercial uses. If it were zoned residential, because at, at an OP level, at the official plan level of the neighborhood designation, you fair enough, you could zone it residential. Uh, someone could plonk a house, big, very expensive house right in the middle of the lot, and then it completely changes the ability for someone to do greenfield development in an economical manner to lay out the roads effect. Like maybe it got put in the perfectly terrible spot right where a road should be coming through from the abutting property. So if you zone it future development, it prevents them from doing anything. And it just acknowledges that, yeah, well, you know, you're going to do an amendment one day because the underlying OP designation permits a whole bunch of stuff. And this is a very large property generally, again, at the fringe of town. The escarpment rec designation, again, is kind of similar. It prevents a wide range of uses. So to pre-zone something like residential, it might not be appropriate, for example. Like the, the, some things have been discussed about servicing or karst, right? Like there's a lot of unknowns there. So instead of coming up with holding provisions, guessing at unknowns that you might not fully know yet in the absence of site-specific investigation, you just put this FD zone, future development, and say, yeah, you can't do anything until you come in and you do all the studies and you justify this, these zoning provisions that comply with the framework and have appropriate consideration for all of this stuff in the official plan. That's kind of the idea behind that is to avoid permitting something as of right that shouldn't be while acknowledging that there's OP direction to do something there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I was, I was kind of thinking about it in terms of like when we say future development, maybe we don't mean like future building developments, right? It's that we're waiting for future developments to arise so that we can yep. make an assertion, uh, an assertion as to where uh, this should should by right be zoned, and that's that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, I I, I accept that that's uh, a reasonable use. It's just it just seems like it's again just to go back to my point that 
the definition says that it's set aside for future growth. And I, I think that's a mistake. I think it's, it's that we, we just don't know what those development lands are unless we're talking about the, the need to have two different designations. One where it's like, we're actually talking about building a bunch of buildings here, whatever. Like when we're talking about growth, again, we need to know what we're talking about. Uh, or B, that, that you need a separate designation to say, these are areas w that we don't know about. <laughs> and we, so it's, it's up to the, the landowner to sort of make their case as to why it should be zoned in some other way. I, I suppose, you know, FD as, as a class, uh, it's convenient to have those two things together. It's just that for the public, it doesn't, it doesn't suitably, I think, differentiate between those two classes of, of property. That's a good point. And if there's, I think uh, if, if you were reading the non-regulatory guidance section, that probably explains the purpose of the FD zone. And if it says future growth, for example, and if, if you think that's a, a not exactly the most appropriate wording, please you know point out the section that you think is implying something uh, too specific. And maybe it should say this instead. Like that's the kind of feedback that's great to have especially in a non-regulatory guidance section. And, you know, there's latitude to provide modified wording there. Thanks, Matt. The section uh, I'm referring to is 615. Thank you. Did you have more questions, Emmett? No, thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, I would remind anyone wishing to uh, provide a comment or ask a question of Manager Rapke that they need to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate their wish to do so. If they are calling in by phone, they can dial star nine to raise their hand. Um, and at this point, Manager Rapke, it does not appear uh, that anyone in attendance is wishing to uh, ask a question. Okay. All right, last call for any questions. I'm not seeing any hands. So thanks for coming out tonight, everyone. Again, uh, actually, give me one sec. I'm gonna flash the information back up on the screen in terms of contact. I can figure out how to start this. Go share screen. Are we seeing the communication slide, Renita Thompson? Yes, we are. Excellent. So I'll just leave this here for 30 seconds or so. Everyone can write down this information if needed. Again, thanks for coming out. So if you got questions preferred means of contact is zone gh at great highlands my email is on the website you can email me directly it's ideal if you email the zone gh because then everything is logged under that email inbox there's no way we can ever lose anything related to the project because every we go back to that inbox and we can review every single thing that we received related to this this update so please email that um, i will reply to you from my email i always copy that email too if you need to reach out by phone, you can do so. Uh, I might not be available to pick up, as I said, but I, I can get back to you uh, by phone. Uh, and if you have suggestions, uh, again, please write those up. Letter format's great. Um, keep it kind of formal. Uh, and then especially if you have an attachment, I can easily attach things to a future report for council. Um, and uh, serious, um, serious research done by people with, you know, a lot of supported justification uh, for some desired planning outcome. If if you are looking for an opportunity to have an influence by doing that, please, please do so and send that along. And I'm more than happy to, to speak with you about your ideas. So thanks again for coming out, everybody. I think we will end the meeting here uh, and stay tuned for future meetings. Send an email if you would like to subscribe for notifications 